So uh, they did not care if they were the right Indians. They did not care. So they come up and, and people already, before the soldiers came, there were different groups that were already taking down their tents because the, the event was over and people were slowly saying their goodbyes and going home, gathering up. So there were some tents coming down, there were some tents still up, you know, got the lollygaggers that like to take their time and visit more. And so the, the camp is in different arrays, half the tents are coming down, half of them are up and people are talking and hides and weed everywhere. And, and um, so here is this large group of soldiers coming. And Big Head gathers up his people and he says, we have no problem. We have never had a problem with them. We've never fought the white man. We've never participated in a treaty. They're not coming after us. So they gathered around and they had a white flour sack. <coughs> so they got a stick and they put that white flour sack on that, on that stick. And Big Head went out there with that to parlay, to talk. He went out there to talk to Sally and him. What would be the problem? Translators. <laughs> so we have the boys, who later end up living on Sandy Rock, but we have the boys, who knew French, who knew a bit of a Ricara, who knew a little bit <coughs> of Lakota, but he wasn't fluent. So he's the translator trying to translate. So they say, you know, we come in peace. These guys really want to fight you, you know. Um, and so there was this, this miscommunication. If you read the transcripts of, of what is what he's saying and what um, he's telling Solly, and you read, read the oral testimonies of Big Head and them and what they're saying, it's way different. And so, so the Fram boys makes it sound like these guys are ready to fight. They're going to come. They're going to come after you. And, and, but they're saying, hey, you know, we got all our women and children here. We don't want to fight. We've never had a fight with you. You know, we come in peace. And so Sally says, calls his troops, surround them. And so the, the soldiers surround them and they quarter them off and take them as prisoner of war and hold them captive. And it's just, just getting done. And I always tell people, you know, I got into this, this finding out about Whitestone not because it was something I knew about growing up. I remember Ag um, Agatha Fulbert come over there and say, and do you know about Nape? And I would say, yeah, yeah, you know, because they tell us these stories. Do you know the story? <laughs> she used to always come and say, yeah, you were here, you told me last week. No. <laughs> but, and then I found out that the State Historical Society that is the only documentation they had about Whitestone was from her. So she's an old lady and they, they interview her about what happened there at Whitestone. And so that's how we end up getting involved in all of this coming up there. So she talks about that. She is a, she is a little girl, nine years old, and she talks about playing. She's playing with her cousins her female cousins, and they're playing. And she said, the sun is just going down. Can you just see the red? And the soldiers start shooting. This is the first time that, that in their mind, soldiers shoot at dusk, just as the sun's going down. And so everybody starts running and scrambling, and they're shooting. And so the men are over here trying to stop them. And the women and children and stuff go around, all the way around. There's a tall here. They go around into this ravine. Well, the soldiers come up on this side of the ravine and this side of the ravine, and they're trapped. And then they start shooting down into the ravine. So as they're killing all these women and children, the men are out there. The men are throwing themselves in front of front of the women. And one of them makes a hole. 
knocks out those soldiers in the front to get the women and children to run, so the rest of them start running out as hundreds lay there. And I'm shortening real quick, because sometimes, you know, when you talk about this stuff, it's not good to talk about, but it, it's real. It hurts. But as these women and children are, are dying, and men are dying, these they, these warriors stop and get a hole open up enough to get, get them going, and the women take off. And I remember Ambrose Little Ghost always talking about his grandfather, how they tied him to the horse and hit the horse so that he could get out of the battlefield as a little boy. And women went out there and tied their babies to the dogs, chasing the dogs out of there, trying to save what they could. And now it's dark, and the soldiers stop shooting, and it's pitch black. And the soldiers write about this. They said, you can hear wailing and crying and, and little kids yelling, Ina, la la, unchi. But they're calling in the dark, and you can hear mourning. Even the soldiers were out there, wounded, laying as it's dark. But nobody moved during the night. And so my grandmother, she was nine years old, they shot her in the hip. And so she went down and she laid on that field till the early morning, she talks about, when the sun was rising. Laid there and cried. And she said, when the sun came up, two soldiers came and picked her up and threw her in the back of a, a buckboard where she laid. And so the soldiers went out. Order number one. <coughs> Kill all wounded. So the soldiers went out there and started killing the women, the children, the men that were laying out in the battlefield. The next order, kill every dog. And I always thought that was strange. Kill every dog. And the soldier talks about, um, there were all these dogs running back and forth with little trow voices with babies hooked on him. So we'd have to run down the dog and <coughs> shoot the dog and shoot the baby. Soldiers. So as they're, they're going down, um, they estimate they killed almost 6,000 dogs at Whitestone. 6,000 dogs, I just can't comprehend. Let alone all the children, the women, so. And then he said, destroy everything. So they took all the teepees, the, the equipment, and this is how detailed they got. Every pot, they were given orders they had to poke holes in it. And so even today as, as we find remnants of white stone, you'll see that the pots they have all have holes poked in them. Because the soldiers actually sat down and poked holes so that they could never use this. And they load it up. The women, the children, the men, the grandmas, the grandpas, the teepees, and the meat. You gotta remember this whole event was, was gathering meat. And so they had mountains of dried meat. Buffalo hides stacked. And they lit them all on fire. And as the fire burned, they said the tallow went down like rivers to the whole plains and they burnt everything. Then they started the run. Get every survivor. So as soon as they got everything burned, everybody got on their horses and started tracking any Indian people they could find and were killing them as they went through. Talk about, they come across this, this woman and she was hiding behind the side of a hill with a sagebrush. <coughs> And so they drug her out and they hit her in the head. And a soldier talks about her, how hard she fought. Can you believe they, this bad thing? Can you believe this old squaw fought so hard? As they killed her. And this killing went on until they came to a place called Big Man. By then, all of our people understood what happens, because remember I said half of the men were out hunting, 
the other half, they all gathered up. And so they started.